Um, there's a guy called Alfie Hart. He's mentioned uh, still, I think, in uh, Scientology 8.80. I think it's, those are the numbers. And it, there, there's a, an acknowledgement to him at the beginning of the book. There certainly used to be. Alfie Hart was the editor to Hubbard's books in 1954. He left and he started uh, a, a network. You know, I'm not the original gangster. I'm not the godfather. This was happening 30 years before I left. You know, it goes right the way back. Hart left and he started a magazine called The Aberie, which is all mm -hmm. online. You can find it. It's hilariously funny. Almost everybody who was significant in the tens of movements that came out of Scientology and Dianetics, people like A.E. Van Vogt, for example, the great science fiction writer, who gave up writing and for the rest of his life, the next 30 something years, practiced Dianetics. Mm. Thought Scientology was complete nonsense. So I corresponded with him. But he and um, Don Purcell, who owned all the rights to Dianetics because uh, he saved Hubbard from bankruptcy, these people would all contribute. So you have this ongoing history. But there's an article in one of them where Alfie Hart says Hubbard should actually every six months when he discovers the secret of the universe, he should say, this is it, but put the date on it. So this is it, April 1957. This is it. And Bruce Welsh is yet another of these examples of, you know, he says in technical degrades, that dreadful mm -hmm. policy letter. Everything I've said is true. You can't change any of it. It doesn't matter whether it was the most recent or an older statement. Whatever I say, that's the tech. And of course, you start going, but there are complete contradictions here. You know, even in simple things, um, you, you never call a, an, a floating needle if it's outside the two to three point five range on the tone arm. And there's another bulletin that says some idiot has said, yeah, it was you, Ron. You, you're the idiot who said you don't do this. And that's the case so often that you become locked. You can't think. You've got contradictory information. Mm -hmm. So coming from Hubbard, and you can't really think with it, tend to do, do what you're told. Behind that is his inability to ever be wrong. Mm -hmm. Is you know, so that he's completely changed his mind about something, but because he researched your know, LSD years after they've come off LSD, um, on research into two cases, I have found one of those two cases was uh, Harvey Haber. And mm -hmm. Harvey told me about this and he said, what happened was I annoyed Hubbard and this woman had annoyed Hubbard. And so he had our folders gone through and you know what a folder error summary can be like, tens and tens <laughs> of hours of work. And the only thing in common was that we'd both taken LSD. That was mm -hmm. the research that said oh, that goodness. all people who've taken LSD are stupid, yeah. you know, psychotic, can't be. Then you find out that Hubbard himself took LSD. Oh. You know, he told David Mayo this out of session. He said, oh, I took that. You know, I got a letter from a guy whose guru had taken LSD with Hubbard in the 50s, you know, and that everything you're into this. You know, originally one of the titles for Blue Sky was uh, Hubbard Through the Looking Glass, mm. because it seemed to me that everything is the opposite of what it appears to be. Scientology claims to be a religion. It's actually an intelligence agency. <laughs> You know, it claims to be liberating mankind from implants. It's actually implanting people with behaviors and ideas and making them more fervent, making them more fanatical to the point, the case you, you mentioned, I, I, I'm not going to mention the guy's name. And I, you know, I don't know if he's still alive, but uh, I was giving a talk and this guy arrived and he was in a wheelchair and he his flesh kind of overlapped the wheelchair. He was a very, he, he was morbidly obese. Mm. And he started talking about being in the Sea Org aboard the ship. And he said that I'd, I'd got everything about Hubbard and Scientology right, except the tech works. That's the bit I'd got wrong. Mm. And uh, I looked at him, he could barely move. His wife had brought him along. She wasn't in Scientology because some of his old friends were, were going to be talking and she thought it might cheer him up because he was horribly depressed. Mm. He then told me that one of our mutual friends, uh, Otto Rose, mm -hmm. uh, who I knew very well in the 1990s, um, 
and, and was very helpful, gave me a tremendous amount of information, um, very thorough, very precise. Um, but it, he started to lose his sight. And this guy was saying that he was devising a process that would give Otto his sight back. Mm. You're kind of going, exactly, I said to him exactly what you said, look in the mirror. Mm. It doesn't work. You know, th there is no Scientologist has passed the level of communication release, which is a very low level. They can't communicate freely with anyone on any subject because they can't talk about their case they can't use verbal tech, they can't describe Scientology, and they can't talk to this huge list of people that they're forbidden, <laughs> free to communicate with anyone on any subject. Then you get to clear an, an operating Thetan. If there was a single operating Thetan, they wouldn't have needed the Guardian's office. They could have seen what was in those files. They wouldn't need to fight somebody like you or me. Yeah. They could just silence us using their superpowers it's not true it doesn't work and yet as you say it will be yeah but haven't you had wins yeah. it's like yeah, yeah. you know I, I felt happy going to the fair i felt happy in the cinema you know these are not it's not because of the process of cinema then i now have to worship cinema that i thought that you know apocalypse now was a good film yeah. it, it it kind of makes this thing dependent upon the guru, the god figure, the, um, the bringer of wisdom. And in Hubbard's case, um, you're dealing with an incredibly tortured soul. You're dealing with a very unhappy man who was ill pretty much all of the time. You know, he talks about terror stomach in the 50s and his ulcers, which was his actual war wound. We didn't find anything else in looking through the records. So he did say he fell down a ship's ladder at one point. He even admits this. There's a, I think it's 23rd September 1950, Introduction to Dianetics, a lecture which David Miscavige has now issued, where he tells the truth about failing his course in atomic and molecular physics. And yet yeah. later on, he becomes a nuclear physicist. Yeah. He tells the truth about having something wrong with his feet. And that was about the limit of his war wounds. But he had ulcers. He was an alcoholic. Um, mm. We now are in the situation where there are some people who were with him who really want to believe. And you can only start thinking, do they have Stockholm syndrome? Mm. Did they really not see him screaming his head off at people, giving them severe reality adjustments? Mm. Because I've interviewed quite a lot of people. Did they really think that overboarding would not be traumatic? This man who'd come to cure trauma is throwing people overboard. For a minor, minor error, not some hideous crime, but throwing overboard anyway. Yeah. Thing. yeah. Punishing yeah. people, hurting people to, yeah. to release them from engrams. <laughs> and putting a child in the chain locker. That was the one that stopped me. The, you know. the viciousness of Scientology is something hard to swallow because it's an entity of vengeance. Vengeance. Every SP clan cutting you off from everybody else and the punishments they give, it's retaliation and vengeance. A religion, John, I know you'll agree with me, should have kindness, compassion, love, harmony, uh, engagement in the oneness of our higher selves the but it should bring out the you should become a better human being because you belong to this entity then the religion has done its job you are a better human being because i'm a da -da -da. in scientology the vengeance and hate i was in 40 years 40 years. And I never, ever thought of speaking out, ever. I vented a little under an anonymous name called War and Peace. I vented some, but I was going to go my, I lead a very full life. I do animal rescue, which is a huge part of my life. Uh, and I'm plugged into all, I, I, I have lives with my art dealing totally outside the cult. I need a full life. I didn't need to be this. 
but they immediately in vengeance, because I was talking to Mike Rinder and Mari Rathman, cut me off from my one child, Alexander Chench. And they shipped him off to Dallas Fort Worth so he would be far away from me. And they completely cut the line saying, she's a suppressive person. But before he left for Dallas, they got my son to call me. And he said, mom, mom, I want you to go to this page. It was a hate page that the cult had set up on me. They got my son to visit a hate page and call me up and say, can you, can you look at the... John, I had a boob job. I felt dowdy when I came out of the Sea Org. I had a little bit of, who cares? Who cares about somebody? It's, it's a boyfriend, girlfriend thing. I had a boob job. The only people that knew was my auditor, because at the time I was a true believer and you had anesthesia for surgery. So I ran Dianetics. So only the cult knew. It's not something you broadcast for. Who needs to know about somebody else's boob job? So they did a hate page. Ha, 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 Karen de la Carriera had a boob job, blah, blah, blah. And they got my son to take me to this hate page and say, mom, you had a boob job? They got my son to say this on the phone to me. Then they mundled him off to Dallas Fort. Long story short, he died at 27 years old. He had no mom because he had been told he had been completely, he grew up in the cult and nobody talks to an SP. And I was the suppressive person. And his father, Heba Gench, president of Church of Scientology International, was in lockdown for eight years in that hell called SP hole, suppressive person hole. So he had no dad, no mom, he was orphaned. And when he got pneumonia, walking pneumonia, he took no antibiotics. John, a $20 antibiotic would have saved his life. $20. He had no, he, he was taking, he had chest pains, which your lungs can give you with walking pneumonia. And he kept taking drugs. And he even took methadone or whatever. Anyway, he was dead. So I feel the cult of Scientology have blood on their hands. Oh, the reason that Alexander Gench died at 27, can you imagine the loss? You've got two, two beautiful boys. I mean, just three, 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 because Sam was one. Can you imagine the loss of your son? This is what the cult did. I call it a death cult. So busy were they having vengeance. She's speaking out, we're going to take away her son. And then they, they would rather he die than I'm known to be affluent. I'm a pretty affluent person. I would have had a full medical done on him. He would have been on the right antibiotic within an hour. But they chose out of the vengeance, which came from Hubbard and rolled down, because Hubbard was very much into retaliation. Every SB declared is a vengeance on you. You can walk in and out of the Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic church. They don't put out an issue on you saying you're an anti-social personality and you will never talk to your son again. That's the cult of Scientology. And after Alexander died, I started my YouTube channel. And I have 11.5 million views in seven years, which means more than 1 million people a year listen to my voice on YouTube. They don't look when they're stupid and foolish and fling out a hate vendetta. They don't dream for a moment of what the consequences can be. They're trying to appease and placate David Miscavige. So they think in the moment, and by God, I come back. I come back and expose. 
<laughs> I didn't dream how successful I would ever be. So John, my respect for someone like you is beyond what I can say. Because you're on the road to truth and it's in your DNA to expose lies. I, 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 I've been, when I listen to you, when I follow, when I, I see your urge to just unveil and uncover falsehoods, fakeness, the person of belief because of swallowing the hogwash. And therefore, I salute you. Thank you. Well, the feeling is mutual. And, and it is that Hubbard in, um, in 1968, a, a, a journalist called Charlie Nairn, who'd already made one film about Scientology, was tasked by Granada TV to go and interview Ron Hubbard. And um, it took him a while to find him, but he got there and he made a documentary, which is the best documentary that will ever be made about Scientology. And I've worked on a few called The Shrinking World of L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, I believe I even, yeah, I've seen it. It is it's on YouTube, it's 20 minutes yes. long. It's yeah. the only hostile interview of Ron Hubbard. And he comes apart. He had a first wife and a third wife. I had no second wife. He, said, no second he named wife. two wives. He, 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 he says, I, there are no Swiss bank. Oh, there's one Swiss bank account. Yeah. When asked, um, does he believe in reincarnation? He pauses. So Charlie says, uh, but your followers believe. And he goes, oh, yes, they believe. <laughs> and you, you sort of get the man. But what Charlie said was that for two hours before the camera went on, from about one in the morning, one or two in the morning, he and Hubbard talked. And he said to Hubbard, it's a scam, isn't it? And Hubbard went, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. And he said, Charlie, is, he, just, he was about 25 at the time, lovely guy. And he said, it must be so hard for you having to keep the pretense up all the time. And, and Hubbard was, yeah, poor me. You know, kind of. Good and so Charlie Nairn said to him, why do you do it? And this is where the revenge thing comes in. The first part, he said, it's nice being able to tell your wife you've made $10,000 today. This is 1968. So that's mm -hmm. more like a million dollars. You know, it's certainly hundreds of thousands now every day. That's nice. But he said, the real reason is I like to catch the clever ones and reel them in. And for me, that's a 10-year-old boy saying, Nobody loves me. I'm going to get my own back on you. And that's what Scientology is. It's Ron Hubbard's revenge on the world. You know, mm -hmm. I last year I published a chapter with Steve Hassan. I didn't know, actually, it hasn't been published yet. It's coming out in the Oxford University Press. And we looked at Elliot Roger, uh, mm -hmm. the Ila Vista killings in Santa Barbara, who was this mm -hmm. young man who was an involuntary celibate, an incel who railed against, because women wouldn't go out with him. And he's saying, look, I'm good looking. I've got money. I've got this fancy new BMW. Why won't? And he's put out these videos and then he went and killed people. He killed six women and three men. And in his departing video, he said that he was going to show women the world over that they shouldn't have rejected him. And that mm -hmm. felt so much like the little boy Hubbard, that, that kind mm -hmm. of immature idea of, I'm going to show you all. I'm going to teach you all. And Hubbard kind of did because he left $648 million that he had extracted vampirically mm. from his followers, who in return got what? The feeling that, of euphoria, the sense that they were special, the belief that they were superior to the rest of humanity. What else did they actually get? You know, they didn't have any special powers. They couldn't resist disease and illness they didn't have perfect memory or emotional equanimity or any of the things he'd promised he got his revenge he he showed people what fools they were and from what i hear about ot8 this kind of explains that the whole thing was well you, now you've got to undo everything that you did and that, that'll be <laughs> i got we got to do a show just on ot8 i have so much data it, it would be a saturday night live special that means we would get so much laughter. You know, this is all so dark, so hateful. So 
we could lighten it up. I've yeah. got to do a show on OTA for you. But you know, one thing I do want to tell you is I loved that you connected so well with David Mayo. He was my dearest, dearest hero. I just absolutely, I got comment because of the, I tried to stay David loyal to David Mayo after he was declared. And I got a committee of evidence just saying, she thinks David Mayo is a great man. Um, I, I, oh, my track with David on the ship, uh, what a man of honor. If there's one word, with you I go into the word, if I could label, it's truth. Truth versus lies. With David, I think honor and integrity was most important to him. I, uh, we have so many mutual friends. Ira Chalif was the commanding officer of AOSH UK when I was this young intern at St. Hill. And I've known Ira through Jay Howitz. He, he's a friend. He fled in base when those 12 were all sent to the running program. No. He fled. He fled with Alan Buchanan and all the others. Metal. Is Jay alive and well? Is Jay chugging I've along? I've been in touch with Jay for years. You I haven't, think. didn't answer, but, but uh, you kept me in suspense. Did he testify? Uh, he, he did, yeah. Um, he did? Um, Whoa. <laughs> the case was won. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, Ira, I, I've stayed in touch with, I've yes. known him for 43 yes. years now, I think it is. And yes. Of, you know, he actually worked for me briefly when he was on a leave of ah, the seal. Ah, so ah. the point where he went to the US and uh, yeah. in what, 82 and was declared suppressive, I got yeah. I was called in by Peter Shantz, who you probably also know. Yes, who, I know Peter Shantz. Peter called me in St. Hill and said, you know, you've got to come in. And I'm, I wasn't the sort of person who felt compelled to go to events or anything like that. So somebody was insisting I do something. I didn't necessarily do it, but Peter was so insistent. So I went in and he said, um, there's a rumor that Ira is going to be declared. What are we going to do about this? And I said, well, of course we'll fight it. It's a ridiculous idea. The idea that Ira Chaloff is suppressive, forget it. You know, he's, he's a wonderful guy. And a week later, I got a phone call from Peter Shan saying, I've got to come in again. So I went in. And he said, um, he's been declared. And mm -hmm. I said, what are we going to do about it? And he said, oh, these people, you know, they can be so devious or something like that. I'm sort of, well, well where's the declare? What, what's he done? He said, oh, there isn't one. I'm sort of, but so there's no court of ethics, committee of evidence, no bill of particulars. This is, this is illegal. This is off policy. And he's like, no. So said, How do you know he's declared? I've got a list of 600 names. <laughs> Six hundred. Wow. That, that's your idea of, of Scientology. My idea of Scientology was you follow the policy that says this has got to happen. And I, you know, that was that was actually the next six months. I'm not really talked about this because Ira was, you know, because he was working, you know, with congressmen and things like this from the yes. 1980s. It was a bit of a difficult situation. But he has now gone public. I wrote a, a book five years ago and he he said he contacted one of his friends who he knew would disconnect from him because he said, look, I'm supporting John Atack and, you know, mm -hmm. he's, you know, so that's the way it will be. But but he has spoken out. He's had an incredible career. He is one of the really? most important yeah. thinkers of our time with courageous followership and intelligent disobedience. And you have to say he learned this in the negative. He learned <laughs> by being around Hubbard. Yeah, the only time I've ever seen a severe reality adjustment because I wasn't in the seal was yeah. Ira did did it to my wife, my first yeah. wife. She hadn't sold any paintings that week. I'm I'm an artist. That's my real wife, and she hadn't sold. So he got her in a tiny little room, stood two inches away from her, and screamed at her. And I hovered outside the door. I'd never heard anything like this before. And the next time I saw him, about three days later sat in man and said what what were you doing where's where's the policy on doing that and he said there is no policy and i said if it isn't written it isn't true because that's what you said. <laughs> and he, he i said who told you to do this and he put his head in his hands and he started crying he said hubbard did it to us mm -hmm. and at that yeah, it was a 
major shift. You know, I was still a Scientologist. I'd done OT5 and all of that. I wasn't very happy with Scientology and the way it was going, but I still really believed it was the, the way, the truth, the life. It was the only thing that was going to save mankind. And here I'm being told that the man who created this system is a raving lunatic. You know, for me, anybody that cannot control their temper, that's not a Buddha figure for me. That's not a guru figure for me. Somebody who feels they have to burn people to the ground with their rage. Imagine how many people are there out there still are still traumatized. I met a guy who'd been 20 years housebound, 20 years without leaving the house because Hubbard had told him he was a suppressive person and he didn't want to hurt anyone. Wow. It took one afternoon to get him out and about again, you know, largely, in fact, because of his wife's incredible endurance and patience. But he mm. sat down, he read, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky and mm. talked with me yeah. for a couple of hours, went back home, got a job and it was over. But the nice. effect that just one conversation with Ron Hubbard had had on him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> Nice anecdote. I, my suppressive person declare is a lot of fluff and fluff and froth of nothing. But what was highly amusing is a charge in my SB declare was that I yelled and I screamed and I interrelated with this screaming. And I thought to myself, you were not on the ship with Hubbard. You say ice cream? Hubbard would shake the Apollo with his temper tantrum rages, which would even to Mary Sue, his own wife, he was completely out of control with his temper tantrums. Yeah. That, <laughs> to name me as someone who now and again yelled when Hubbard was the poster boy for yelling, screaming, throwing temper tantrums and losing it. And, and it, again, it, it supports this idea that he never grew up. He was a child. He, he never matured. And he had, you know, it, I saw it so many times. What, what happens in Scientology is somebody, they, they do a process, they feel fantastic. They feel really high. They write a success story. They go and borrow some more money. And three days later, and it's usually three days later, they don't feel so good. Yeah. Now they're a potential trouble source. What an interesting phrase that is. Yeah, the Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Lost your gains, your PTS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and post traumatic stress, of course, accidentally picked up the same uh, initialization, yeah. PTS, <laughs> um, which is what you will get in Scientology, that's for sure. Then, of course, you have to go and get the next dose to get the yeah. feeling back. And it it excludes everything else. When I interviewed um, people who, who were doing transcendental meditation, it's about 1991, I was asked to write a book, which I decided not to write. I was shocked when I found out there were people who were meditating 12 hours a day. Their children were running wild. They'd lost their job, but they'd become so obsessed with this feeling that they were getting, this high they were getting, yeah. it had become more important to them than their own yeah. children. Yeah, yeah which I but, personally cannot understand. We covered earlier. It's, it's like a heroin fix or something. They want that high. A human being wants a high, whether it's a million dollar win at a casino or a drug like LSD or whatever, to get that high, they will go through pain, suffering, heart. Look at, look at these people, the slaves in the sea they just stay on year in and year out with devastated lives because they believe I got that high and I can get it again. Things will change, blah, 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 blah. John, listen, it's been just enchanting having some time. We, we can, I hope you will invite, I've got, uh, I've That's got things to tell you. I really have got things to tell you, but let's not, I think that when it's a little shorter than too long, we get more audience. I've learned this very well with my channel. And we've talked a while. It's been just really great to hang with you. 
John, talk to me soon, huh? Yeah, uh, well, let's do this again. Really. It's been a real pleasure. It, Thank you so it's much. Really, really, it was fun. It was fun. Bye bye. Bye, bye John. Bye. Thanks a lot. Love to you and a big hug. So, uh, what do you call it? Virtual hug. Virtual, Virtual hug. hug. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks bye a lot. Bye. I've been John Atak, my guest, Karen de la Carrier. Thank you.